Welcome to the Monty Collier Report. I'm Monty Collier. We're in Book 1, Chapter 10 of the Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin. If you haven't read that chapter yet, then do so immediately before listening to this lecture. John Calvin reminds us at the beginning of this chapter that he is still only speaking of the knowledge of God that relates to the creation of the world. In Section 2, as Calvin is going over God's attributes, he writes the following, and I quote, These three things it is certainly of the highest importance for us to know. Mercy, in which alone consists all of our salvation. Judgment, which is executed on the wicked every day, and awaits them in a still heavier degree to eternal destruction. Righteousness, by which the faithful are preserved and most graciously supported. End quote. Institutes Book 1, Chapter 10, Section 2. Again, I'm using the John Allen translation. The law does not forgive sinners, but it condemns sinners. The Bible calls the law the ministration of death and condemnation. See 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9. The law is not merciful to sinners. We are all sinners. The scripture hath concluded all under sin. Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. Because we are sinners, the law is no safe mode of justification. For the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The law only justifies those who can obey perfectly. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Romans chapter 2 verse 13. No sinner will receive mercy from the law. Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. James chapter 2 verse 10. Well, let's thank God that the gospel of Jesus Christ justifies sinners by God's sheer mercy alone, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Titus chapter 3 verse 5. As we saw in the quote from the Institutes, Calvin correctly testifies that all of our salvation consists in God's mercy alone. The gospel is God's wonderful proclamation. He is nothing but sheer mercy for us. That he forgives us all our sins. That his son Jesus Christ took all of our guilt upon himself, expiated all of our sins, completely propitiated the wrath of God for us, perfectly kept the law in our stead, satisfying the entire law of God for us, covers us with his imputed righteousness and freely grants us the title into eternal life. This is the gospel of salvation by grace alone. It is justification by faith alone. The gospel of Jesus Christ does not contain the least bit of law for us to keep nor does it make any demands upon us. The gospel is about God's pure grace and mercy for us in Christ alone. The gospel is only about Jesus Christ, who is perfect God and perfect man. And it's about what he did for us. Today, however, denominations and their pastors, uh, some who claim to be reformed, while they know nothing of law and gospel and its distinction, why it should be separated, some of these individuals flat out reject any distinction between law and gospel. Foolish men that boldly claim the gospel demands our works for salvation, while they simultaneously claim to be Calvinists, some of these men, I kid you not. Today we have Presbyterian and Reformed jackasses who stand in the pulpit with their fine suits who publish expensive books to the world which idiotically claim the gospel of Jesus Christ is you must join a church. You must obey your elders. 
You must tithe to the church. These devils have turned the gospel into law. They have made Christ a mere law dispenser. There is no law gospel distinction for these well-paid Calvinist wannabes. And these jokers arrogantly state such heresy, counting on their lazy, dumb congregations not to check their claims with scripture alone if they are even listening in the first place. John Calvin, on the other hand, emphasized law gospel distinction throughout his writings, especially in the Institutes. As he teaches that salvation is by God's mercy alone, Calvin, following Scripture alone, correctly describes the gospel of Jesus Christ to be free of any demands upon us, free of any commands that we must keep, free of any requirements of law-keeping on our part, and free of conditions which we must fulfill. Calvin writes the following. Pay close attention to this. This is excellent. He writes the following, and I quote, here it is proper to recall to remembrance the relation we have before stated between faith and the gospel. Since the reason why faith is said to justify is that it receives and embraces the righteousness offered in the gospel, but its being offered by the gospel absolutely excludes all consideration of works. This Paul very clearly demonstrates on various occasions, and particularly in two passages. In his epistle to the Romans, Contrasting the law and the gospel, he says, Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth these, those things shall live by them, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Do you perceive how he thus discriminates between the law and the gospel? that the former attributes righteousness to works, but the latter bestows it freely without the assistance of works. It is a remarkable passage and may serve to extricate us from a multitude of difficulties if we understand that the righteousness which is given us by the gospel is free from all legal conditions. This is the reason why he more than once strongly opposes the promise to the law the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. More in the same chapter to the same purpose." End quote. Institutes Book 3, Chapter 11, Section 17. That passage from Calvin's worth reading a few times. If you don't have that marked, you should mark it. Okay, I want to change gears. I want to talk about um, a different subject before we close this video. Um, something I want to the listener to notice and pay attention to as we read through the Calvin through the Institutes by Calvin. As you may notice in this chapter, there's not a single mention of common grace administered uh, to the people in these quotes. Nor in the chapters from any of the quotes that I've given in this video, as a matter of fact. But especially here in chapter 10. Going back to the first quote. I provided, Book 1, Chapter 10, Section 2. Since Calvin has declared that he is speaking only of God's attributes and providence, then where is this so-called common grace that so many people today claim Calvin taught? I can't find a hint of it. can't find a single trace of it, actually. I see clearly that Calvin teaches that God's grace and mercy are given to the elect alone, but I see no mention of common grace for the reprobate. I see Calvin imply that judgment is executed upon the reprobate every day until they receive eternal damnation. That's clear. But I don't see a bit of common grace. I see Calvin speak of how the faithful are preserved by righteousness, by his grace alone. But why does Calvin not speak of a restraining grace and a social grace, which is supposed to help infidels do good? Common grace simply cannot be found here in chapter 10. I haven't found it in any of Calvin's writings. For Calvin simply didn't hold to such nonsense, in my opinion. Calvin was too busy distinguishing law from gospel in this chapter to move on to such nonsense. In section 3, Calvin tells us that Scripture rejects all other false gods 
like Allah. Despite the idiotic claims of Herman Bavinck, which we saw a few lectures back, and who seems to think that the originators of false religions are not agents of Satan and inimical to God, see Herman Bavinck's Reformed Dogmatics, Volume 1, pages 318 through 319, if you need to refresh that. Calvin writes the following on the topic, and I quote, For even the wisest of them evidently betray the vagrant uncertainty of their minds when they wish for some god to assist them, and in their vows call upon unknown and fabulous deities. Besides, in imagining the existence of many natures in God, though they did not entertain such absurd notions as the ignorant vulgar concerning Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, Minerva, and the rest, they were themselves by no means exempt from the delusions of Satan. And, as we have already remarked, whatever subterfuges their ingenuity has invented, none of the philosophers can exculpate themselves from the crime of revolting from God by the corruption of his truth. For this reason, Habakkuk, after condemning all idols, bids us seek the Lord in his holy temple, that the faithful might acknowledge no other God than Jehovah, who have revealed himself in his word." End quote. Institutes Book 1, Chapter 10, Section 3. Right. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, keep up the studying. See you